buying a house is most likely the biggest purchase you'll ever make and in most cases it takes up to 20 years to pay off this bond so that's why it's important before taking the big step of actually buying a house we understand what exactly we're getting ourselves into and understand the obligation we have from our side so we ensure that this big dream of us of owning a house doesn't become the most expensive mistake we make in our lifetime because the dream of owning your own house can quickly become a nightmare. That's why in today's video I'm going to share some really important information that you need to know before taking the plunge of buying your first house, especially for first time buyers in South Africa. And if you pay attention to the things I'm going to mention in this video, it will put you at an advantage when you are looking for your first home to ensure that you do get the best deal possible and don't end up with some nasty surprises that may cost a lot of money in the short term and in the long term as well. But without wasting any more time, let's get straight into the video. Number one, offer to purchase. I put down the offer to purchase as the number one thing to pay attention to because seriously, this really is a big deal. What a lot of people do is they view a house, they like a house, and then they want to put in an offer on the house. And in order to put in an offer on the house, you need to complete a form which is called an offer to purchase. So this basically just states your offer that you're putting in on the house and the conditions of your offer. So a lot of people take this to mean that basically you just need to say how much you want to buy the house for. But what people do not take into consideration is that the offer to purchase is actually a legal document and it leaves you legally binding to whatever is written in that offer to purchase. So it's not just a matter of putting in an offer of say 1.5 billion house and then writing the offer to purchase and then you think the work is done. <laughs> no. It's definitely much more to it than that because as i mentioned the offer to purchase a legal document it's not just something you can back out of if you do back out of it it might leave you with having to pay costs to the seller and on a house of 1.5 million it might cost you in the region of 150,000 to 200,000 rand so that is a very big mistake to make if you don't take the offer to purchase seriously but let's look at some of the things that should be an offer to purchase let's just use the example of a house of 1.5 million when you're putting in an offer for the house you put down that the offer is for 1.5 million but you always need to make sure that the offer has expiry date so basically you say that you're putting an offer of 1.5 million on the house expiring in 72 hours be sure to put down the exact date and time of the expiry date if you don't have an expiry date that means that the seller can actually just take that offer to purchase and they can keep it for three months or four months or six months or even a year that offer would still be valid so they can use that offer as leverage when other people are viewing the house and at the same time you won't be able to put in any other offers on a different house because you've already put in another offer to purchase so if the seller do accept the offer after six months you're legally bound by that offer so it's very very important that the offer to purchase has an expiry date 72 hours should be enough time so that's not the only things that the offer to purchase should have in there are some other things that you need to make sure that's in there and I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because this can actually be a whole video on its own. So I'm just going to briefly touch on the things that the offer to purchase should have in and if you guys want to go into more detail at a later stage, I'll be able to do so in a separate video. So not only does the offer to purchase you need to have your price and your expired date, it should also state what is included in the deal such as the gas stove, blinds, curtains and full cleaning equipment. Anything that is not attached to the house or physically fixed to the house, the seller is allowed to remove it. So the offer to purchase needs to say what the seller needs to leave behind. Even if it's a pot plant, you need to state it in the offer to purchase. Otherwise, the seller is allowed to remove it. Another very important thing the offer to purchase should have is the conditions under which you will accept the bond. This is a way to ensure that if you don't get an acceptable deal from the bank, you are allowed to walk away from the deal. So it's important that when you offer in of a house, you should say that it is on condition that you receive an acceptable bond from the financial institutions you approached. I would even go as far as the state exact percentage that I'm willing to negotiate for. Anything higher than that, I'm able to walk away. Another very important thing that the offer to purchase needs to state is that all building in the house should be on plan. Whether it's extension build on or lap or whatever, the seller needs to give you the plans for the house and all those things need to be on plan. This one is very important and will save a lot of money in the long run of having to put these things on plan after the fact or even save the heartbreak of having to break down a braai room or a bowl down kitchen at a later stage. Then the last thing that I just want to put in for the offer to purchase is obvious one but you need to state that the seller needs to provide with all the relevant certificates that will include the electrical certificate to show that everything is done according to standard, the gas certificate if the house does have gas, and also the beetle certificates. And there's also a lot of other things that the offer to purchase should have in, but I can touch on that in a different video. But let's hop on to the next thing. 
Number two, estate agent tricks. This brings me to my next point. Watch out for estate agent tricks. If you ever rented a house or bought a house and you came in contact with the estate agent, you will know that they are some of the nicest and friendliest people you will ever meet. They are friendly, talkative, and very interested in what happened in your life and very interested in what you have to say. But be very wary because a lot of times they are just a ploy to get you comfortable to ensure they get the best you possible. Because let's be serious, at the end of the day, they are in it for a commission and the higher they sell the property for, the more commission they will get. So here are a few tricks that you need to look out for to ensure that you don't put yourself on the back foot and that you end up overpaying for a house. Scarcity is a tool that a lot of estate agents use or a lot of marketers use to put this buyer in a position where they feel they need to act immediately, otherwise they might lose out. This is actually a very common tool all over. If you go on a website like Booking.com for example, you will see that whenever you're looking for a hotel, you'll always get a pop-up that says three rooms available and two people are looking at it. That's actually just a ploy that the website uses to create scarcity to make you feel that you need to book immediately, otherwise you'll miss out. Estate agents use a similar tactic for scarcity to ensure that you feel that you need to act immediately and that you can't play around on this deal and at the end of the day, you end up giving the highest offer possible. The way they often go about employing scarcity is by telling you that they already have an offer on a place or they tell you that they expect an offer in the next day or two. This makes you feel that the buyer already has an offer on the table so you can't mess around, you need to put in the highest offer possible and also you need to put in offer today without actually considering the options or considering the cost involved. Another tactic that is the agents often use is by phishing information by being over talkative and being over friendly. This tactic is twofold. Number one, it makes you feel comfortable and makes you feel that you can trust the estate agent and that they have your best interest at heart. And the second reason is so that you divulge as much information as possible in the hopes that you let something slip that might give them the upper hand. You might mention that your lease is expired at the end of the month. To an estate agent, that would mean that you're quite desperate for a house because at the end of the month, your lease is expiring, which means you have no place to live. So they will know that you are desperate. And if an estate agent sees that you are desperate, trust me, they're going to reject the first offer, even if the seller will not accept it because they know you are desperate and they know you are willing to pick an higher offer. So be sure to look after these tricks so that you don't put yourself in a position where you end up overpaying for a house. Number three, know the true cost a lot of people when they put in an offer for a house they think that that is the offer they put in and that is what the house is going to cost for instance they put in an offer 1.5 million and they think that is what they need to pay and that's a bond they'll get but there's actually a lot of other fees that come into play that might actually give you a shock the first of those fees are the transfer fees and the bond registration costs as well as the transfer duties these are figures that are determined by the price of the house and you're not able to get a bond for this which means you need to have the money up front on a bond of 1.5 million at prime your fees will be as follows roughly 27,000 rand goes to transfer cost 27,000 rand will go to the bond cost 6,000 towards initiation fees and around 19,000 for your transfer duty so that's the money that goes to source so you'll have to end up paying around 80,000 rand on a 1.5 million rand bond on a bond of 2 million at prime you will have to pay around 31,000 rand in transfer cost 31,000 rand in bond cost and around 50,000 rand in transfer duty to source which will make a total around 120,000 Rand that you need to pay in extra that you won't be able to get a bond for and you need to have that cash on hand. On a bond of 2.5 million, you'll have to pay around 36,000 Rand for transfer cost, 36,000 Rand for your bond cost and 91,000 Rand for transfer duty which goes towards source. So this is around 170,000 Rand you have to pay up front before you can even get a bond. So these are some quite significant fees that you need to be cognizant of. And while we're on the topic of the bond, it's also important to know exactly what your bond is going to cost you. A lot of people go to the bank and they see that they're able to qualify for a bond of 1.5 million, but they don't really know if they can afford that bond. Just because a bank is willing to loan you 1.5 million doesn't mean that you're able to afford the repayment of 1.5 million bond. And that is why I always recommend that before you go out house hunting, you first determine exactly what you can afford. You go into any banking website and you go on your calculator and you see what a bond of 1.5 million will cost you, what 1.4 million will cost you, or 1.3 million will cost you. And then you'll see what the repayment will be on that and you'll be able to determine whether or not you can afford that repayment. But when you are doing these calculations, also take note that banks might loan you money, but it is interest rate dependent. 
and where the rates go depends on the reserve bank so even though you get the bond now at seven percent it might go back up to ten percent in a few years and then you need to check whether or not you will still be able to afford that bond if the rates do increase so i recommend that when you are doing the calculations on the bank's website that you do it with different percentages summit prime some less than prime and even some quite above prime to see whether or not you can afford the bond repayment number four research is key Research sounds like such an intense term, but rest assured, it's not as bad as it seems. It's just a matter of knowing what you're getting yourself into and ensuring that you get a market-related deal when you are putting in an offer for a house. When you're browsing for houses and you go on Property24 or private property or any other website and you see what other people are offering the houses for, how do you know whether or not that house is market related? Or how do you know that this is a fair price for that house? Do you actually just end up paying that price because you can afford it? Or do you try and get the best deal possible to ensure that the deal makes sense for yourself as well as for the seller and that everybody is in a win-win situation? And I've heard what a lot of people actually do is they go on a website like Property24, they search the area and they see what the house is selling for and they look at the other house of Property24 and if that the house is on the same vicinity in price-wise, then they think that there's a fair deal or is market related. But what people don't know is that on these property websites, the price they're offering really includes a premium for negotiation because sellers know when people come to view houses, they are going to negotiate for a lower price. So what they do is they inflate the price on the website and when people come and they lower the price, they actually give the sellers what they were going to settle for anyway. So that's not really a great tactic if you're looking to get the best deal. I actually have two ways in which you can get to this technique to ensure you do get a market at the price and when it's actually backed up by actual data. The first way to go about this is to go to Property24 and when you're looking at the ad for a house that you intend on buying, you just scroll down to the bottom and here they will show you all the recent sales in and around your area that you are viewing. They will give you the exact address and the price the house was sold for. So now you can go onto Google Maps and view the house to see where it is located and also the type of house to see how it compares to the house that you have. They actually also offer you a free report for 83 Rand and it will give you more details on the house that was sold. But I've actually got some great news on how you can get this information free of charge and unfortunately this is only if you are an FNB customer. I don't know if other banks offer this because I am an FNB customer so I can only speak on FNB, but they actually give this report to all their clients free of charge and a lot of people don't even know about this so if you are an FMB customer and you're looking to get this report all you have to do is go to the app and then scroll down to navigate yeah, you can choose nav home and then you choose property you then select the province and under search type you select street name and then you just hit continue now you can search the address for the house you are going to view and then once it comes up here you can just select it then you can choose to either download the report or have it emailed to you. I will just choose email so that I can open this report so that you guys can see it on my PC. FMB has now sent me this report and actually gives me the details for this property. In this report you can see exactly the price the property was last sold for, date it was last sold for and the estimated value of the property. This is an estimated value so it's not always an accurate but it is a good point of reference. If you scroll down on this report it also shows you the other properties in the area that has recently been sold for or also which other properties has the recent done evaluation on the property and if so, how much the property was evaluated for. So this information is gold in terms of getting accurate view on the price of the house and whether or not you're getting a fair deal or not. You can use information located in this report to get them better understanding of the property you're viewing. For instance, if this property has been sold a couple of times in the last few years, it will obviously raise questions on why people aren't living with this property very long or why they end up selling it so quickly off each other. It could be that there's problems with the house, it could be that there's very bad neighbours and people just not want to live next to them. So at least this will give you an understanding and it's something that you can raise when you go and view the house, asking them why they're selling and why everybody has been selling previous to this. In the rest of the report, just give you some further information about the area, like the percentage of houses in the area, there's a pool, the percentage that has one bedroom versus two bedrooms versus three bedrooms, and so on. This information is also very useful in terms of comparing apples to apples, because you know, if your house doesn't have these things that most of the other houses have, but they're wanting to charge you a similar rate to the other houses in the area, you can use this as a gauge to tell the, the seller that, listen, most houses in this area comes with these things, your house does offer this, and therefore I can't offer you this price. 
even if the seller ends up rejecting your offer, at least you would know that you may have dodged a bullet because you end up overpaying, paying a similar price to other houses in the area when your house doesn't offer what other houses offers. So this information is really good and it can be the difference between getting an average deal and getting a brilliant deal. I actually think this video has gone on a bit longer than what I had planned, so I think I will leave it as that is for the moment. Once again, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.